Wow. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, like it, uh, uh, I was introduced as Herbal Labs, and as such, I get often asked a, uh, a talk about the future, uh, because as you know, the, there's a long uh, history of uh, innovation as Bell Labs. And what people want to know is that the, what, is, what are the technologies that is shaping the future of our, a, our life? And I always start with, it's so hard to predict the future. Many people have tried to predict the future based on the trend in technology and failed miserably. The reason they fail miserably is innovation is not about something that is creating and introducing something new, but it's about the market impact. In terms of market impact, there are other factors, some such thing as a cost, the culture, and other things, and therefore certain a technology we thought was going to be promising didn't materialize. So one, you know, one way to talk about a, a, uh, the future is actually instead of looking at the technology and trying to find a need, but try to understand the need first, and then what are the technologies that can actually um, a, a, can be invented that will provide the solutions to satisfy those needs. Okay? Um, and uh, a, what I want to do is uh, today, I want to talk about some of the examples in Bell Labs um, and that has happened in the past and then what we are doing today, so give you a perspective. So, you know, a Bell Lab is well known for its seminar technology, start from, you know, a cellular concept, transistor, solar panel, Unix, they empower the internet, a, uh, and so on and so forth, satellite communications and whatnot. But it's really the prominence of our people that, that made it happen. One of the a very little known facts about Bell Labs is that Bell Lab recruited worldwide from its inception in, since 1925. So over 50 percent of Bell Lab researchers were, um, you know, a, were born outside the United States. So when you try to find the best people who recruit around the world, you know, you actually a, a, see something wonderful. So this was a picture that I've taken with uh, three of the a, a, uh, uh, a medal winner for National Medal of Technology that is given by the President of the United States. And, and uh, three guys um, are one guy invented WDM systems, the other guy invented electric microphone that you are using today, and the third guy um, invented something called molecular beam epitaxy, which is the, a building a material by atom by atom, so all the nanotechnologies are built on his inventions. And these are three guys out of the seven recipients. And in technology, there is no Nobel Prize. So this is about the highest um, price you can get. And I I'm I'm happen to be in the award committee, so a lot of times I have to um, a, a distance myself, you know, recuse myself from selection because so many of them are actually based on the a, a work that they have done in their labs. So it was a very proud moment. As you have indicated, we have many, one, many, many other prizes. Um, and this is a, uh, another a chart that I want to show the prominence of Bell Labs. You know, one of the, uh, how, how, how do you know whether you are any good is to see you know, uh, how good our research is that it gets published, get reviewed by the peer, and then they cited a, you know, your work as a basis for their work. And this is the work that is done between 2000 and 2010, 10-year period, in the area of computer science, materials engineering, physics, mathematics, um, and the computer, um, a, the electrical engineering. And you can see the Bell Lab is at the top of the, a, uh, of the field. So I want to share a story. Um, year was 1951. The head of research at Bell Lab and gathered together a group of, uh, you know, the section leaders and department head and said, you know, we are Bell Labs, people think we are wonderful, we are creating unbelievable technologies, we are building this wonderful network. And my question to you is, what do you think is the greatest invention in our, in, in our field, telecommunication industry? And somebody raised their hands and says, dialing. Okay? This is the year 1951. Some of you, you know, have to remember it's going back. And says, okay. That's right, that's, that's a great invention. When do you think it was invented? Say, well, I don't know when it was invented, but it was introduced in 1930. Say, well, that's true, but it was actually invented before 1900. Okay, any other great inventions you know, in our industry? Somebody raised their hand, say, multiplexing. Multiplexing, as you all know, is a way to combine signals so you can get more efficiency out of it. 
You say, great, when was that invented? Well, it was introduced between First and Second World, World War, but I didn't know when it was invented. So, well, again, it was invented before 1900. Okay, anybody else? What are the inventions in our industry? He says, well, transatlantic cable. He said, well, when was they you know, laid down? That person knew the answer, 1882. So I said, well, you guys just said three of the most innovative, important inventions in our industry, and it's all happened before any of us were born. So what have we been doing? So there were some deep soul-searching discussions that generated from you know, that, say, people giving us credit for you know, this wonderful work that we are doing, but you yourself are saying we haven't created a really, truly innovative things. And the reason that we, I believe that this is the case is that we are making an incremental improvement in the existing network, rather than thinking disruptive, thinking from the end user's need perspective. So what I want you to do is, I want you to think about if you were to build a brand new network from scratch, Okay? How would you build it? What would you build it? So he divided the group into six separate groups and gave them a task to build different things. One group in particular was um, a, uh, a, a, a charge with uh, building the handset. Okay? And this group of six people. Okay? And, and they basically listed what are the needs of our people. And they said the biggest need at the time was I want to make sure when somebody calls me, that call was for, for me. You got to think about this back in 1951. I guess when you, somebody calls you, it was the wrong number. That was really irritating and ha actually happened quite a bit. Okay? And, and it turns out four out of five phone calls, there was a missed call was as a result of misdialing. Okay? Not somebody had the wrong number to dial, 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 dialing correctly. Okay? So, and then they made a list of 100 things that people thought that they need, okay? They stop at 100 because there are so many, okay? And then top of the list was a wrong dial. So they said, well, now let's work on the uh, solutions, okay? So what they thought about is that, uh, well, if it's wrong dialing, how about if you can actually tell, a, you know, what you are dialing before you actually dial? So they actually made up a little a display pad with a little keypad for the numbers. So you push the numbers, and then you can see it, uh, and then you press the button to connect. If the, it was a you know, miss a, a, a dial, then you, you know, cancel it and redo it again. And at that time, calculator was not invented yet, so there was no such thing as a keypad. So this was something that was, that was invented. And then next question was, can you actually manufacture this thing in a cost-effective way? So they brought a couple of manufacturing engineers and says, you know, can you manufacture these things? And they look at it, and they got excited. They start talking to each other, and they said, you know, excuse me, we got to go. So they left, and, you know, they were quite upset because they don't know exactly why they were left abruptly, and they came back a week later and said, apologize for leaving abruptly, but we got so excited. And what they were excited about was, um, and they wanted to test this concept, is not because of this touchpad thing will be... Um, allowing you to make a call more correct course, but in their estimation, it will save 12 seconds of the calling, which translates into millions, in today's dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, okay, for every phone call. Now, so they called, this is going to be a secret project with a code word, and the code was touchtone. So touchtone telephone was born in 1951 as a result of it. Now, if you look at the list of 100 things, all of them were implemented over time, all of them. They anticipated everything from call forwarding to um, a, a conferencing to a mobile phone you know, to a you know, call forwarding, name it. They got it all except one, except two. It's a camera on the phone and the internet. They, those are the only things that, that we have today they missed. So need-based approach that's wonderful things. So if you were to ask today, I mean, today is not 1951, it's 2012, a um, lot of things has changed since then. You know, clearly that the mode of our information that we interact with is more than just a phone, it's just more than voice, okay? Um, a, a, uh, 
you know, the notion of community is not just based on the sort of localities or your professional things, but it's based on common interest. Um, the culture has changed. World is interconnected and integrated in some ways, right? So the, our needs are different. So, so what are the, our needs? If you were to ask, if I were to ask my uh, leaders, what are the challenging problems today? What do you think they would be? And that's the, probably one exercise thought through that I want to uh, spend time this afternoon with you. Hopefully that it will be entertaining. Um, but one thing that for sure is, you know, it's an iterative process. You know, technology is changing us, and we are a, impacting the way technology will be evolved. So, you know, there's a guy, a very interesting professor at MIT, named, guy named Juan, Juan Enrique, Enriquez. He actually predicts and actually investing money, because he's a fairly uh, a successful entrepreneur as well, money into um, a bunch of startups, and he calls the human being are evolving from homo sapiens to ho homo evolutus. Um, that is a self-repairing, life-extending, a very high-level hominid species. Okay? And uh, you know, who knows how this thing will, but I'm going to show, talk a little bit about the futures, because at the end, you know, a, uh, the, our health, our longevity um, is also very important. And, uh, you know, a, the somatic network is becoming a very, very hot topic in our field. Okay? So I'm going to cover only the high level. Obviously, there's going to be much more detailed level of uh, defining the need. How do you ask, how do you define the need? How do you ask the question? It's the key to uh, really working on the right kind of research project. One is obviously in, intuitive interface. We are just overwhelmed with uh, so much technology, right? You know, and and uh, Steve Jobs, you know, a, uh, made you know fortune, really understanding the human needs for a better user interface. He says, his, you know, in his his you know a, a word, he says, you know, his device should be not just intuitive but delightful. Delightful was not a, you know, in, a, unintentional. It was very intentionally chosen to understand the human need. Okay? And, uh, um, but overall, we do need a better you know, intuitive interface with the, with the technical world that we're facing today. And, you know, tablet is one, for one thing, right? You know, we always talk about the younger generation, millennium generation, who are technical savvy and so on and so forth. Well, with a tablet, we talk about tablet generations. Tablet generation is not just necessarily young, but it's everybody, right? Uh, and it's because of an a, a advancement in the interface. Um, second is the personalization of the information services. You know, we all use technology to do something for you, right? So we do need a, 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 uh, information to be catered to your particular need. You know, network of one we talk about. But the problem is the personalized services is that the uh, you know, and I will talk more in detail. Uh, networks know a lot about you in order to provide services, personalized services, which means that the privacy and privacy control becomes an issue. The other area is that the, you do need a very robust and scalable infrastructure. You know, infrastructure today has a limitations. It's getting to that high limitations. And we, you know, without the robust architecture, we cannot sustain it. And I'm going to talk about that. And finally, the energy. You know, this is a very, very interesting story. You know, I will tell you. Today, the EPU, you know, the a cloud is a big thing, right? With a the cloud, there's a data centers. Okay? And data centers are described in terms of each limit, in each ability to dissipate heat, not by its capacity in terms of physical size or processing capacity. So energy efficiency, um, heat dissipation, all this becomes a a, a, a very important, of, of course, you know, my wife always she asks me, can you invent something so that I don't have to recharge my battery, you know, for my cell phone? So that's a little bit more uh, closer to your. So I'm going to talk about each of these uh, four subjects. So um, I mentioned, you know, a, when you are articulating the need, you really a, have to ask from the human need perspective. We often um, describe the need in the area of a number, amount of bandwidth or amount of, you know, a, 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 a WDM streams and whatnot. But those are the means 
basic needs are things like you know, insight, awareness, you know, fulfillment, entertainment. I mean, those are what human value, human really. I mean, the, the basic human need to, you know, be connected with others, to reach and connect. I mean, that, that's, that's yesterday, right? That's what we network was built based upon. Now, we feel that many of us are actually are connected, have access. Question is, what do you get out of it using the network? That's why over the top players make so much money because the people are willing to pay because they take it basically access to a network for granted. Okay, so value has changed. So at Bell Labs, we are working on a number of uh, research areas that has to do with the cognition, and uh, um, I just talk about some examples. You know, do you remember when was the first time you saw color TV? You know, for me it was 1975. I remember very clearly it was April 1975 because that was the year that I actually immigrated from Korea to the United States. And I saw the color TV for the first time in my life. And I was mesmerized. I was staring at the TV. And what's really amazing is I still remember everything that I saw. Um, you know, cartoons and you know, advertising and so on and so forth. I didn't understand the English, so didn't understand what they were saying. But but I have a very crystal clear memory. It turns out that research showed that if you show in color, you remember better than black and white. Okay? So there are some things that change as a result of a different technologies. Now, do you remember when was the first time you saw high definition TV? You know, Bell Lab has invented the algorithm for high definition TV. My predecessor out of Natural Valley got a, got a matter for it, but you know, we invented high definition TV. I mean, do you remember when was the first time you saw it? For me, it was 1990, and first time I saw it at the place called Neva Research Lab, and what I saw was a screen huge, um, and it was a picture of a, 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 a pianist playing a player, but it was so crystal clear that you could see not only the keyboard from the reflection of his glasses, but his eye movement. I could see the pore in his, his, his face, and I said, oh my God, this is better than face-to-face. You know, -face. In, the, in the real life, I cannot get somebody that close enough to look at the pores of somebody's face or actually can see the emotions in the eyes. You know, this, this is better than attending the live concert. Um, you know, today we take it for granted. And clearly 3D is coming. You know, I mean, at least in the theater, you still have to wear you know, glasses. But you know, without, you know, the technology is behind that you don't have to wear glasses to 3D. Um, again, people are paying premium price to see the 3D versions of the movie today. So people clearly see the value. Now, in terms of a interacting with them, you know, gesture control will become a you know, major event. Today, you know, with a touch, uh, we thought this was wonderful. Well, a lot of a, a, uh, interaction with the, uh, in, a, the network will be based on gesture and other means that comes very naturally to us. So we talk about tablet generations. I heard about this wonderful uh, project that the Turkish government is trying to implement in school project, you know, assigning 50, 60 million tablets to, you know, to students and use that as a means to educate. I think it's unbelievably wonderful vision and a project, ambitious project. Well, why is tablet so popular? After all, you know, Bill Gates, standing in 2001 with a tablet PC, and it never caught on, right? I mean, there are many answers. You can always speculate. You know, you could say, you know, maybe technology wasn't quite there. But I will argue one of the reasons is because of the interface. Okay? You know, in tablet, with a stylus, you know, if you want to turn the page, you know, you have to touch a button, you know, click, click, click. Whereas in, you know, a, in tablet, it's like, it's like a, you know, flip your finger, just like, a, you know, you're reading a book, okay? Of course, the tablet PC in the back then was designed from the, a mindset of a computer designers. It was borrowed from the basically computer architecture. Whereas a, a you know, tablet today is really designed mindset of a, you know, a book reader or, you know, a, a reading, watching movies. It was much more in consumption based rather than a, a, a content creation based, based on t, uh, a uh, PC. So, 
What's really interesting is the, how we interact with technology. That you know, technology is definitely affecting our culture. Kevin Kelly suggested, you know, when technology advances about a factor of 500x in terms of performance, there's a major shift in, uh, in culture. That turns out in today's every decade. That's why it feels like, you know, 20 something are different from teenagers, 30 somethings are, you know, lag behind. Something. There seems to be a generation gap, and it actually is happening as a result of it. And believe it or not, our brains are wired differently, depends on what kind of technology you use. There was some um, work done at the UCLA, uh, Larry Small performed the research and actually measured brain activities of a group of people who use the web all the time versus the people who are not. And their new pathways are created as a result of people who are using the web all the time. And uh, this is a quote from the Eric Kendall, who is a, a Nobel laureate, you know, psych, um, psychiatrist. He says, our ability to alter its own brain function might well shape history as powerfully as the development of metallurgy in the Iron Age. So, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the future. Well, uh, let me tell you, what, you know, some of the work that is being done, not necessarily at Bell Lab. Um, so at Stanford in 2005, they actually connected a uh, mouse, the mammal's brain, with a light wave, um, with uh, fiber cables, and actually tried to affect the neuron, tried to send the signals, and they were quite successful at it. Last, year, last June, in 2011, MIT, at MIT, they actually changed a, a uh, fiber with a wireless radio, and they were actually uh, controlled it. Okay? Um, so, you think if this is a, uh, you know, a so far away, well, yeah, probably, maybe for human, but not necessarily for a, at least in the, in the laboratories. And I was at the University of Pennsylvania um, last year to give me a lecture, and I was given a tour of some of the research they were doing. They were working on the chipsets that can be implanted in your brain, in your skull, to augment your memory. Okay? And uh, yeah, a, so some of this kind of work is not uh, too far away. This is actually a working device, okay? This is a device that goes inside your bloodstream, especially in the like a bloodstream, um, blood vessel where you have a damaged by aneurysm and so on. This was invented by, you know, developed at Purdue University. And when the pressure gets too high, it sends a signal, and it gets powered wirelessly, okay? There is a company called Impace in the United States that measures the food consumption. And when a a, you have, you have sufficient food, it sends the electrical pulse to give you the feeling of fullness. Again, at Purdue University and other places, the micron-sized sensors are being developed that detect the glucose level in your bloodstream. And when levels are too high, it, it, uh, um, it triggers the insulin pump. So, a, you know, this is what we call somatic network. You think it's a science fiction? But in the you know, lab at the universities and bell labs and other places, not just sensor network, but sensor in the, in the body is a very fertile ground for research. Because we believe uh, in the future, we're going to have a network that is all connected. The you know, best way to think about it is the automobile today. Automobile today has so many different sensors. And as a result of it, it has, has a much better awareness about its you know, wellness. And we believe that human beings may um, follow a similar path. So let me move on to a next challenge or need. Um, that is, uh, you know, we are overloaded with too much information. Okay? If you were born in you know, 1900, 100 years ago, amount of information that is being generated and stored will double basically over your lifetime. Today, that happens in every, you know, two to three years, okay? There's, you know, UC Berkeley conducted a study of how much information was getting uh, generated and stored. In 1999, it was a three exabytes. Three years later, uh, they conducted follow-on study of six exabytes. Today, who knows, it's, I think it's going to be over 20 exabytes of the data is being uh, created and stored, and it's only accelerating, okay? We as a human can only a, a digest and store you know, limited amount of information. That number is somewhere around 500 megabytes. Okay? 
So we have something called time knowledge dilemma. There's a huge gap. That's why search engine is so important. That's why we place uh, such a great value in, in, in that. And it's only going to get worse, right? And what we have dealt with in our uh, profession is specialization. It happens in medical field, law, and everything else, even in the engineering, okay? There were, you know, a, 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 because because we, there's so much information, you can only be really expert in only a very small segment. And at some point, you know, a, you lose the perspective. You become, always just become a specialist. So um, these are some of the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the uh, research areas that Bell Lab is uh, uh, deeply engaged in. But what I want to use, uh, talk about is, uh, uh, since we talked about, you know, a use of high technology in the education, I want to talk about the use case. Um, I, I have two daughters at the Stanford University, and I've been involved with the university for a number of years, especially their online education for the last 10 years or so. And they actually offer online courses, okay? Um, and uh, uh, this is simply more than just, you know, streaming the lecture. What they are trying to do is use an a, a online lecture along with the professor's um, information, but augmented with uh, information that is uh, available on the net network because everybody learns differently, right? And, uh, but information that you need, and this is happening not only in the education, but in sports arena and so on and so forth, where you watch sports, but you also augmented information from the, a, uh, in the available that is on the net about you know, a, a, a statistics and whatnot and so forth. But there is nothing that is more important than educating our children. And I think a, this is one of the areas that's going to be, I think, going to be huge that is, um, in the near future. But in order to do this, first of all, you need to be able to, um, you know, basically collect all the data, you know, and sort out the data, and then make some sense of the data, and then based on that, have some sort of recommendation systems that proactively work, you know, doing with you real time. So you need a, a data mapping and analytics to do it, and you need the inference engine to make some sense out of all this data and then interact with you. And then, because there's going to be, you know, multiple users, it has to scale. So you have to have uh, some sort of a, a, a policy um, engine to, um, to deal with it, it scalability issues. Again, this is the photo ground for research. Now, I said earlier, um, personalization of services is what everybody wants. But at the same time, we also, you know, a, a want privacy. But it is almost oxymoron, right? Because networks know so much about you to give you personalization, but yet at the same time, you want privacy? Well, actually the trick is to focus on not privacy, but privacy control, okay? Now, I want to give you an example of what might be a possible solution to this, okay? So this guy orders a book online. Okay, first thing that happens is the, the, a, you know, somebody collects the data about the, you know, buying this book and how much it purchases and, and who supplies and whatnot. Okay? And then that transaction gets captured and then combined with the other transactions, online transaction, this guy, let's call Bob, has done in the past. Okay? And then based on that, you make a recommendation what are other things that you want to buy. Okay? Amazon does that. Before, right? You know, you read these kind of books here. Yeah, maybe you want to read these books, and so on and so forth. Well, those data get sold to somebody, and then uh, they also use that data to do something else. In this particular case, the insurance, insurance company that determines the premium, you know, how much this guy should pay. And in that data was the uh, you know, guy purchased a secret, cigarette, although he quit cigarette long, smoking a long, long time ago, that he, you know, a, a, this insurance company applied high premium for this. Well, Bob will have no, no way to find that out that this was happening, right? No way to control it. Okay, so he lost the control of the information that is relevant, that is affecting him. I'm just using this rather simple example, but this is happening all over, and you guys all understand this. So how do we deal with this? Well, one, there are many ways to solve this problem, but one way is maybe use of metadata. Think of metadata as an uh, uh, expiration date on the food label, 
when you buy a food, you got a, you know, expiration date. So if you actually have a metadata on top of a data in the transaction that says, at some point, it expires. In some conditions, I don't want it to be used. So if you can give the control of the data through use metadata to the end users, it is one way of, of course, this will, you know, again, excavate amount of data that will be created because you have you know, another layer of structure to deal with it. But we do need to deal with it. So when you have an atom and you rotate the a, electrons around it, it becomes in different quantum state called non abelian state. So you're comparing the Iberian state to the non abelian state, you can actually a, build a, a, a qubit machines that can be built into a quantum computers. He demonstrated his result 2010, okay? Um, you know, again, the way, to, way the scientific world works is that it's got to be a, a, a validated. Has, somebody has to be able to reproduce it, you know? But if this gets successfully reproduced, we get to do this. I mean, this guy will win the Nobel Prize. Um, you know, small interesting fact is that the uh, Bell Labs, we actually hire people from you know, any field. They can work on almost anything. He's a medical doctor, decided to get into um, quantum physics for some, in some strange reasons. Um, I'm going to move on to a third challenge. Um, you know, we have a huge network issues that I'm sure our operator, our customers always deal with, right? In the past, we have a, some sort of traffic pattern based on that traffic, you know, a, using the predictive algorithms to be able to build out the network and do planning and whole nine yard. But today, you know, the predictability is, uh, you know, almost, you know, a, a not useful because uh, peak variation, um, it's so huge, so we need a flexible network to deal with the major variations in the network traffic. On top of it, the growth in traffic is so huge, basically driven by a, you know, a videos and you know, images that people are using their end devices are constantly exchanging and so on and so forth. So how do you build a um, network infrastructure that is flexible and robust? Well, first of all, the question is, you know, can you actually accommodate the uh, growth in traffic? So let me talk about a couple of technologies that uh, uh, we are working on. We struggle with this question quite a bit, right? I mean, you guys all take it for granted that, you know, we're going to have a technology that will allow you to grow the traffic forever and, and so on and so forth. Um, that really isn't true, okay? And I'm going to talk about the very fundamental. First is optical, okay? In optical transmissions, basic technology is you got a laser on one side, you're flipping the light, and you got a receiver on the other side, you, you know, detecting the light signals, and then you, you, know, you send the information there. So, you know, a way to increase the traffic is actually sending faster, faster, you know, signals, right? You flicker fast, and you got a detector that can detect it, okay? That reached the limit, basically. Direct detection has reached the limit of quantum and others. Um, at 100 gigabits per second, okay? But that's the, that was the one of the ways we were able to increase the traffic. And then we invented something called WDM. And Bell Labs invented this. That is basically sending multiple wavelengths into single fiber, different color, okay? So you can actually increase, you know, more and more wavelengths into um, single fiber. So you're actually increasing now in two dimensions, faster, faster laser, and more and more um, a light signals. The problem is, is that the, you, hit, you hit the what we call channel limit. What it is that as you put more um, wavelength into this, you inject more power. And then what happens is that the a power, total power affects the property of the fiber. And then fiber interact with the light signals. So it become a, a, become a nonlinear. So we, have a, we hit the, what we call the nonlinear channel limit. Okay? So, and the quadrature is a, something called a, 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 you have a different coding method to send more signals. So we do something called coherent detections using different type of coding to use a, a powerful digital signal process to decode it. So using all these techniques, we basically add a limit of what we can do in terms of a, a, a maximum throughput through a fiber at about terabits per second, okay? Today, you know, the systems that you see in the commercial system is about a, a 100 gigabits per second, okay? 
in the, in the lab today, we are experimenting at 400 gigabit systems, actually 200 gigabit, um, a, a coherent detection in two polarization to get a 400 gigabit per second. But we need another factor of 10, factor of 100, two orders of magnitude over the next 10 years. How are we going to get there? We've been stuck in this thing for oh the last five, six years. I used to run optical um, business. So this was something that I struggled with until last year. Uh, my researchers came up with uh, this brilliant idea called a um, space, space division multiplexing. Idea is that, uh, you know, hey, why not use a space? You have a, it's an idea, think of it as a, having multiple, you know, fibers, but you can actually do it in a single fiber, okay? And then you mix it together. Problem is that the cross talk and everything else, but we have a concept to deal with it. And uh, with this uh, space division multiplexing, we can foresee, we have demonstrated, uh, again, a, uh, uh, another order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude, um, a, in being able to you know, a build out the network. I'm not sure, uh, 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 well, anyway, anyway, so this is uh, some of the research that we have produced and demonstrated. Clearly shows that uh, it has an um, a ability to meet the demand. Actually, one thing I didn't say is that the demand that we're expecting based on the order traffic that we see, in 2016, we are gonna, we're gonna pass that limit of what's physically possible, theoretically possible using the current technology. So we need a new technology, totally new technology. Okay. So let me move over to a uh, wireless. Um, I understand in Turkey, you, you, you have a network that is based on 2G and 3G. I'm sure people talk about, I, the previous talk, you know, speaker talked about LTE, fourth generation, OFDM, MIMO, all these technologies were invented at Bell Labs. Um, we are implementing that today. But I want to talk about this, that the, you know, things beyond 4G, okay? Because 4G is here today, we understand what needs to be done. What's needed in the future is solutions that, um, that can allow people to move around, but be able to use minimum energy, and then at the same time, a scale the needs of the high broadband uh, users. There are more and more people coming onto network today, and more and more people are becoming uh, broadband users. And mobile internet is uh, internet going mobile is the you know, mantra of the day, right? So how do you accommodate this? Well, one way to do is use what I call large scale um, antenna systems. Idea is actually like this. Today we have a, one antenna that serves the many handsets. Okay? Instead of having one antenna serving many handsets, you have a many antenna serving one um, mobile handset. Cheap antennas everywhere, okay? And, and you do actually con have a, a directed beam, beam forming, so that you use absolute minimum energy necessary, okay? And then you can, you know, so think about it. In wireless, there are only three ways to improve the throughput. One is to use more spectrum, right? And that, but which is a you know, limited, you know, kind of a commodity, okay? The other one is a, a, a uh, uh, using a reuse of spectrum, the concept of cellular you know, architecture, again invented in Bell Lab in 1947, implemented throughout the years, and you can make it smaller and smaller and smaller, so you can talk about the small cells, pico cells, femto cells, all these things are topics of today. Okay? Third is better use of a spectrum. Okay? This falls in the third category. Okay? But in a very different way than we have been doing today. Okay? We have demonstrated with this, we can get not only orders of magnitude better in terms of throughput, but also a energy use, which will become incredibly important, will drop a, a accordingly as well. Again, these kind of things are very difficult to push forward um, because you know, it had to be adopted by standard bodies and everything else. But sooner or later, we do need a disruptive solutions like this in order to accommodate the traffic growth and the, our need um, in the mobile broadband internet. Okay. Now, we talk about latencies. I mean, people always talk about, uh, you know, we need a bigger and bigger bandwidth. Um, but, you know, why? Well, 
One of the answers is because you do need faster response and uh, uh, latency matters. Right? There is a company in New Jersey that is uh, spending $300 million to a, build a new transatlantic ca um, a cable from New York to London to cut 5.2 milliseconds of the traffic, round traffic, just from 59 points, I mean 64 uh, milliseconds to like 59 milliseconds you know, traffic, round trip. And the way they're doing that is basically you know, cutting out several hundred miles of the, you know, the cable, okay? physically doing this. And there are brokerage firms lined up to pay huge amount of money to pay for this service. Because for them, that matters. You can make fortunes okay? or lose fortunes being able to have a response. Um, now I decided to put this thing up because the big industries in gaming, okay? as people satisfy with their basic food and everything else, entertainment cost is coming straight through the roof. I don't know if it's experiencing in Turkey, but in the United States, boy, entertainers are the ones who make the most amount of money because, um, because people really value entertainment. Now, in entertainment, interactive gaming, all these things, latency becomes critical. Not only in the transmissions, but entire network. That's why you need better overall architecture based on IP that is service aware and have data centers that is structurally just right to have overall response and latencies that is consistent with the applications you are running. So integration of optics to IP, the you know, switching and, and layer to the actual applications, the integration becomes a key issue. And, and it is one of the major research areas, again, because it's not that straightforward. Now, I want to uh, uh, share a story um, that is kind of interesting. Uh, um, the topic is the energy management. So 1999, um, our company was asked to uh, uh, bring somebody you know, famous to celebrate China's first high-tech fair in Shenzhen. It was hosted by Premier uh, Zhu Rongji. So we decided we're going to bring two Nobel laureates you know, from Bell Labs. And the uh, president of Bell Labs at the time, and I was the president of the data networking group. And uh, two of the uh, um, you know, a, a Nobel laureates, Stephen Chu and Horst Stromer, who got the Nobel Prize in 99 and 97, uh, to attend this conference. And uh, a you know, we were flying our private jet, it took us about 24 hours. We were heavily debating, instead of sleeping, about some topics. And that topic was, what's the difference between human brain and computer brain? Carbon logic versus silicon logic. And of course, we were, you know, I mean, it's, it was a long time ago, so I sort of forgot m most of the debate. But one thing that we had agreed on, what major difference was human brain the limitation is our ability to dissipate heat at about 20 watts, whereas the computer did not have that, that limitations. Okay? Fast forward today, 10 years, 12 years. Today, as I mentioned to you, the entire globe is interconnected, okay? and everything is going into cloud. In the cloud, there's a data center that, you know, they, they store the information, and guess where the limitation is? Heat dissipation, cooling capacity. I told you, the data centers are limited by cooling capacity. So it was really interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm telling you this story um, because uh, in the summer of 2010, uh, you know, I was in the uh, meeting with our executives, our CEO, in what we call corporate social responsibility um, review, and we are reviewing the how our equipments are compared to our competitors in terms of uh, our energy efficiencies. And our CEO asked question, you know, okay, so we are doing better than maybe the competitors, but is there a fundamental limit, just like Moore's law, in our ability to, um, you know, achieve certain improvement in energy efficiencies? So I said, well, I didn't know the answers. I, I, mean, I didn't think there was any because I didn't know any. But then I asked the questions to my bad lab researchers. And, you know, it's really funny how it worked. Well, they start talking. All of a sudden, there was a major debate on about 30 some researchers. 
about this question. And they came back with an answer. The answer was, I was asking the wrong question. The right question that I should be asking is, is there a fundamental limit in a, uh, um, a energy efficiency now network? I say, okay, so what's the answer to that? And say, uh, answer to that is yes. The answer is 10 to, uh, uh, 10 to the fourth to 10 to the eight times. That's uh, 10,000 to 10 million times better than the network efficiency today. Okay? And the 10,000 is based on the wireless, and 10 million is based on the AR or optical. And this is not a, a, a random number. This is a, 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 a based on the, you know, the first principles and you know, extensive work and uh, produce a white paper. I read this thing. I said, oh my God, what have we been doing? I mean, we've been satisfied with uh, achieving 20% efficiency improvement because our competitors are doing 15% year over years where the ceiling is four, five, six orders of magnitude on the average, you know, say, a million times better. Well, it turns out, if you look at today, um, a, the amount of a, a computation need to, that use 20, to, to generate 20, 20 watts for human, it takes 20 megawatts for computers. So it's, you know, it's, so it's in, and there was a, a report that was in the um, science magazine. And so, so it's finding, it's very similar, okay? So I forwarded that white paper to Stephen Chu, who is the Secretary of Energy. And I haven't talked to Stephen Chu since he became the Secretary of Energy because I didn't want to bother him, you know, because, you know. And he sent the email back same day. He obviously read it. He says, can we talk about this? I said, when? He said, how about tomorrow? So I went down to see him and we talked for four hours. He understood. I mean, I, we were just amazed that, the, you know, so we actually decided that the, let's do something about this, okay? And we actually put together a consortium of all the leading universities and the, you know, a, equip, you know, a makers and, 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 and the carrier customers. Let's put the best brain together to see if we can create an architecture that demonstrates the energy efficiency improvement by a factor of 1,000, three orders of magnitude, than what it is today. We are two and a half, way, half year into it, we have made a very good progress. I think we're going to make it. Okay? Now, the implication is very simple. Back in late 1950s, early 1960s, MIT produced a paper that packet network has a potential for, you know, a orders of magnitude better than the circuit-based network. Okay? The IPA and others put together a, a uh, four-node network to prove that, the, you know, it, it is feasible. The IPA net become the internet today. It took a long time. That was only one order of magnitude. These are three orders of magnitude we are trying to improve. I think impl implication be phenomenal, fundamental. Um, so one of the demonstrations we did recently is in the G pond that we can actually reduce the uh, you know, use of power by a factor of 30, 30x. Okay? Um, and the idea is really um, it's simple. Um, you know, a G pond send out all these information and, and, and a, uh, a receiver basically process all these informations and then only pick the ones that you, know, you use. So instead of doing that, you can actually synchronize and pre-sort it. It's just like you know, sending the mail. Okay? Instead of sending all the mails and you sort it out and then you know, they pass on to the next thing, you just pre-sort it and send the ones that only you need it. Okay? That's the idea is like that. Very simple, but it's more than sleep mode, right? With that, you can get a 30x. And it's very important because most inefficient systems are at the, towards the end, end users. Because at the core, it's very, very efficient because it's, a, it's being shared. Um, and if you look at the, what might be, um, you know, a, a, a uh, technology that can also handle uh, a heat removal, um, there are a number of options. Um, we use the, uh, using the you know, Moore's law, um, Use it uh, two years. You know, I know that uh, most of you know, heard about you know, 18 months. Um, a, a original war was every two years, but uh, this was uh, 18 months was modified by you know, one of his uh, executive that observed that with the efficiency in computations, that can be more like 18 months. Um, you will see that uh, a, 
somewhere in something after 20, 20 when, when the distance between the atoms are like, you know, maybe five atom size, it's like getting the melting, quantum melting. Okay? So um, you have a, a physical limitations we see in, in terms of a, a current technology we go. So some of the cooling method from you know, what we do today in air cooling to a flow car to we are heavily into micro uh, a, a fluids. There is a you know, micron sized way that basically using electrical charges to you know, flap it to create a, a, a hot spot to cool it. Okay? These are very, very advanced techniques, but a, one of our systems in light radio which is uh, you know, a small antenna system for a metro type of applications. Um, we want to use a, this kind of a cooling device because a, the physical size has to be small, has to be a restored the environment. And, and, and these are some of the key technologies um, that is going into that. So if you try to predict that the, when some of this technology can come into the market, we can make some prediction based on you know, our past experience. But reality is that you know, this uh, feedback cycle is getting faster and faster. So real challenge for us is that to bring it closer. And uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, that's the real challenge for all of us. So that's all I have for uh, my prepared talk. Appreciate uh, you staying up late to listen to my talk. Hope it wasn't too boring. Thank you. <laughs>